experts believe that two famous alien incidents, known as the Battle of L.A. and Roswell, may have led to the U.S. government creating a special and classified organization to investigate and control information about aliens. The alleged clandestine 12-member group is known simply as the Majestic 12. Washington, D.C., 1947. Top secret UFO investigation agency, the Majestic 12, has been created to combat an increasing alien threat. But who are these men? There was a general feeling that whatever UFOs were, strange, spooky, weird, odd, the subject of science fiction movies, somehow people on the inside knew exactly what they were, people inside the United States government. After the PR fallout of the mishandled Roswell incident, it was obvious to many Air Force insiders that an elite, hand-picked team needed to be created to control and monitor the increasing UFO phenomena 24-7. The man allegedly chosen to oversee Majestic 12 is James Forrestal, U.S. Secretary of Defense. Forrestal is the man behind the scenes, but who can be trusted to run Majestic operations on the ground? One name catches Forrestal's eye, Vannevar Bush. He is the first scientific advisor to the president and a key figure behind the Manhattan Project, code name for the world's first atomic bomb. Majestic 12's first priority is to limit the public's knowledge and exposure to UFOs. Run out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, experts believe Majestic 12's first official operation is codenamed Project Sign. Project Sign sends operatives into the field to deal with a rash of recent sightings with the purpose of clamping a tight lid down on UFO phenomena in America. June 24th, 1947, pilot Kenneth Arnold spots a series of disks flying in a strange formation at incredible speeds near Mount Rainier, Washington. Several witnesses corroborate the incident. The story appears in American and Canadian publications. From those stories, the term flying saucer is introduced to the public. The very publication of Kenneth Arnold's story sends shockwaves through Majestic 12. How did even this small amount of information get into the public domain? Though the press is kept in the dark, one thing is clear. The problem is escalating. Although America's nuclear development is still in its infancy, ufologists fear mankind's new experimental energy frontier may be part of the problem. Some experts speculate atomic testing and the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki have attracted attention from other worlds. It is obvious to many in the scientific community that if extraterrestrials exist, they may be using a similar concentrated energy source to power their spacecraft. One of the men behind the Manhattan Project atomic tests is Vannevar Bush, the same man who is now head of Majestic 12. Vannevar Bush orders all Project Sign information. From this moment on, the American government's official public position is that extraterrestrials do not exist. But information leaks and insidious press coverage split Majestic 12 into two distinct factions. Those who feel the public must be made aware of UFOs and those who feel proof of alien life must never reach the public again. Coming up, the secret knowledge of an alien presence on Earth may have led to one of the most devastating events in American history. This is Unsealed Alien Files, exposing the biggest secret on planet Earth. Welcome back to Unsealed Alien Files. 1949, Majestic 12 is at a crossroads. Insiders are pushing for some public form of disclosure, and the man who oversees the organization, James Forrestal, feels the time is right to tell the public about the presence of UFOs. But there are also agents who will stop at nothing to prevent disclosure. How far would Forrestal's opponents go to keep a lid on the truth? Washington, D.C., March 9th, 1949. James Forrestal is asked by President Truman 
to step down as Secretary of Defense. Is Forrestal's forced retirement the result of his stance on declassifying the existence of alien life? As his health declines from stress, he checks into Bethesda Hospital. On May 22, 1949, James Forrestal falls to his death from the hospital's 16th floor. The official cause of death? Suicide due to depression and nervous exhaustion. But as new evidence begins to surface, suspicion regarding Forrestal's death begins to grow. Broken glass is found in Forrestal's hospital bed, suggesting a struggle. There are allegations the suicide note left behind is not in Forrestal's handwriting. The military inquiry into the matter is classified top secret and not released. Washington, D.C., January 20th, 1953. Dwight D. Eisenhower succeeds President Harry S. Truman. Eisenhower has a strong military background and is the first president to be aware of alien activity before taking office. In 1952, Eisenhower is aboard the USS Roosevelt during a NATO training exercise. At 1.30 a.m., a bright ball of light appears over the vessel, hovering 100 feet above the water. Eisenhower and several others watch the UFO for over 20 minutes before it speeds off into the night sky. Upon taking office, Eisenhower digs deeper into rumors of unexplained phenomena. He becomes aware of Majestic 12 and demands to know the full extent of the alien threat. But Majestic 12 rejects the idea of letting anyone, including the president, into their inner circle. The president responds by sending a team to confront Majestic 12 on his behalf. An anonymous witness to these events recently attended the citizens' hearing in Washington, D.C. on UFO phenomena and the government. He's trying to find out something about, all about these aliens that MJ-12 was supposed to find out, but never did, never sent back reports to him. So he said, uh, I want you to fly out there. I want you to give him a personal message. He says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get him into Washington and to report to me, and if they don't, I'm gonna get the first army from Colorado, and we're gonna go over, we're gonna take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're gonna rip this thing apart. Majestic 12 allegedly backs down, and the team is allowed access to Majestic 12's most sensitive information. They had like different saucer crafts. The very first one had the uh, Roswell craft in. But the greatest shock came in the lower depths of the base. And then the colonel said, what we've got in here is we're interviewing a gray alien. Returning to Washington, the team is debriefed by the president. So he asked us what was going on. And we told him about the alien, and he was just totally shocked. He appeared for the first time to be worried. The president had sent a message to Majestic 12, but our anonymous field agent also received a message in return. Two guys in a black suits come out of a black Lincoln town car and came over to see me. And he told me that I better not publish anything or talk about any more things. If Majestic 12 was powerful enough to conceal this from the very government that controlled them, what other secrets were they keeping? Although the details of extraterrestrial contact are kept from him, Eisenhower's successor, John F. Kennedy, has ambitious plans for expansion into outer space. Two years after taking office in 1961, President Kennedy opens negotiations with Russian President Nikita Khrushchev. 
they agreed that NASA and the Russian Space Agency would cooperate in joint missions to the moon and share any information they had about UFOs. But still, Majestic 12 refuses to declassify any UFO activity. Aware of their internal resistance, on November 12, 1963, President Kennedy allegedly issues a final order to Majestic 12, demanding they release all extraterrestrial information. But 10 days after the agreement with Russia is signed, John F. Kennedy is dead. Did Majestic 12 participate in the assassination of JFK to prevent him from gaining access to information about extraterrestrial life? The world may never know. Coming up, is increasing UFO activity a sign of an impending alien invasion? Or is an invasion even necessary if the group that was created to protect us has already betrayed us? These are the Majestic 12 documents. They describe the establishment of a super-secret U.S. government organization in 1947 to deal with an alien spacecraft that allegedly crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. If genuine, they are the most important government documents ever leaked to the public. The question, however, that has dogged the documents from the first day they were released to the public in 1987 is whether or not they are authentic. To answer that question, I traveled to Aztec, a town in northern New Mexico. Like most small towns, Aztec has a main street, but that's not what it's famous for. In 1948, a flying saucer allegedly crashed just outside of town, and with the story of a crashed flying saucer has come the pop culture trappings of modern ufology, a museum, and a UFO symposium. Like any conference, a UFO symposium is a beehive of volunteer activity. They're also a lot of fun. But at their core, they're serious business. Because at a UFO symposium, at least at the good ones like Aztecs, you'll find these guys, ufologists. In 2003, some of the best in the business were featured at the Aztec Symposium. These are serious guys, historians, scientists, authors, internet whiz kids all of them dedicated to discovering the truth behind the UFO phenomenon. If this were a trial, they would be the expert witnesses. With every controversy, you need a yin and a yang. With Majestic 12, the yin is Carl Flock. He doesn't deny that some UFOs are probably alien spacecraft. He just doesn't believe there is any evidence that they were recovered by the government. Needless to say, he doesn't buy the Majestic 12 story. And there's a fly down there. The Yang is Stan Friedman, a nuclear physicist. Stan has been on the UFO beat for over three decades. He is the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident and the biggest advocate of the authenticity of the original Majestic 12 documents. I don't know how to do that. Finally, there's these guys, the alleged members of Majestic 12. There's no question that they were an all-star group, top military leaders, scientists, and civil servants they were among the best and the brightest that America had to offer in 1947. But were they members of this top secret organization known as Majestic 12? Were they at the center of a government cover-up of extraterrestrial life? The skeptics say no, because, well, that's what Carl Flock is here for. So I'll let him handle the yin from here on in. The first big problem with them is that there's no provenance. We don't know where they came from. We have, we don't know, none of the original documents are in hand, so there's no way you can test the paper, you cannot, you know, you can't really look at the inks, you can't, there's none of the stuff that you would normally do with a question document, you can't do it. In the United States, at least at the time we got the memo, it was not against the law to have classified material that you were not entitled to. It was against the law if you were entitled to see classified material, if you had an appropriate clearance and need to know, to photograph it, certainly against the law to distribute it to somebody without a clearance. So the guy at risk is the guy who took the pictures, not the guy who receives them. Secrecy protocols within the military in particular are extreme. Penalties are extreme. Um, you sign away your constitutional rights in many cases when you are exposed to 
very, very sensitive classified information. And uh, in many cases, this is binding for life. So it's not that easy to just to go talking about what you've experienced. We still don't know who Deep Throat was. Does that mean that whatever information he provided is worthless because we don't know who he was? He's the guy who was at risk, remember. And that's what we have to consider here, too. Providence would be nice. You make do, you look at the documents for what they are and what they say. Not with any preconceived notion, well, I don't know who put this out there, so it must be phony. That's nonsense. That's not reasoning. If you feel your life or liberty is in danger by, by releasing these documents, of course you're going to want to remain anonymous. It's an unfortunate situation that we can't um, verify all these things. But guess what? That is life. That's life within the field of UFOs. And the reason is because this is a, a problem pertaining to national security. In other words, this is not just a normal scientific topic on, as people like to say, a level playing field. There is no level playing field here. This is like a huge jigsaw puzzle. More than half the pieces have been taken out intentionally. Fake pieces put in sometimes. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to wend your way through this. The NSA said that 23 of the documents that came from other agencies were from the CIA, which somehow the CIA hadn't found when it did its court-ordered search. So I filed for those 23 documents. After two years, I got nine. These were, as John described to you this morning, press abstracts of Eastern European newspaper articles about flying saucers, which the Russians had the day they were published. Their own 14 documents they withheld. I appealed. Three years after that, I got four. You'll see what they look like. There's a CIA UFO document. Boy, they're not keeping any secrets. But it's all released, Stan. There's no cover-up, I was told, by people in the UFO field. It's 99% sources and methods, they say, and 1% UFO, except it's filed under UFOs. Does this make any sense? Not to me, it doesn't. And many times when people have requested documents through Freedom of Information Act, they, they have asked that, don't, don't put any sources or methods, and we, we don't want to know. We just want to know the details of the UFO sightings, since if there's nothing to them, and, and, and the subject officially doesn't exist, what's the, what's the problem with releasing this information? It still doesn't work, and the documents that, that have been blacked out, uh, I, I do think that that is the case. I can't, can't prove it, of course, uh, but sources or methods would not seem to encompass, say, 75% uh, of a document or 80% of a document when Stan holds up those pages blacked out. Uh, I, I just cannot believe that it's, that it's all, well, the, the, uh, operations, sources, methods, there's got to be some details of the UFO sightings in there. Otherwise, uh, you know, what's the document concerned about then? We've seen thousands of pages that are completely blacked out from top to bottom. You know, maybe those are the MJ-12 documents times two. You know, we don't know what's under those black lines and black paragraphs. That maybe underneath that it tells a story that is so bizarre and so out there, pardon the pun, but um, when you look at that, that maybe those are MJ-12 type documents that they talk about the UFO phenomenon being real, being the, you know, extraterrestri extraterrestrial life is, is visiting us. On the question of a government cover-up, let me introduce you to the CIA's report of the Scientific Panel on Unidentified Flying Objects from 1953. Its conclusions? That the national security agencies take immediate steps to downplay the UFO phenomenon. The methods? A broad educational program by all agencies that would concentrate on training and debunking. This education would be accomplished by the mass media all this despite the fact that the panel of eminent scientists accepted that the Earth might be visited by extraterrestrials. One panel member even found that the ET explanation, in many cases, was the only logical conclusion. Is it a coincidence that the panel was convened by Walter Beetle Smith and included this man, Dr. Lloyd Berkner, both alleged members of Majestic 12? Unfortunately, in the field of ufology, the truth sometimes takes a back seat to innuendo and rumor. When that happens, the lines between fact and fiction can become crossed, and the difference between what is real and what is not can become that much harder to distinguish. I consider that MJ-12 indeed was a hoax, that it was perpetrated in aid of advancing the case for Roswell. 
Um, Bill Moore and Stan Friedman, who had done a tremendous amount of uh, work together in investigating and looking into the, everything that they could find on Roswell. Jamie Chandray, who came into the picture somewhere along the line there, and I don't know exactly when. I think they sort of, you know, they were sitting around saying, okay, now what? And there have been extant in ufology for a long time rumors to the effect that Bill Moore had suggested that it might be a good idea to fake some exotic documents that seem to confirm Roswell with the idea that this might smoke somebody out. Uh, either to deny them or to produce real documents or whatever. And uh, it is said that uh, he and Stan Friedman and, and uh, Chandray and maybe one or two others uh, talked about this together and that Stan said, well, yeah, why not? You know, I mean, if this will do it, why not? I have many times heard that I supposedly said, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea, as suggested by Bill Moore, that documents be fake to try to get some more information about Roswell. Now, I had many meetings with Bill and Jamie and other people, so there's no question we had meetings and talked a lot and worked on projects together and so forth. I categorically deny that I ever was offered that possibility. Hey, why don't we fake some documents? Or that I ever said something like, oh, that's a good idea. I think that's what was going on. I think that, you know, there was a, the idea was to, if you put the most innocent spin on it that you can, was to smoke something out. If you put the not so innocent spin on it, it was to essentially fake documents that would back up the Roswell story as it was told and as it was known uh, through the Roswell incident. Because if you look at it, that's what it does. It's the version of Roswell as written down, as set down and in the Roswell incident. That sounds like a pretty good theory, except for one major problem. The Roswell incident describes two crashes, one near Roswell and one in western New Mexico at the plains of San Agustin. This second crash is not mentioned in the MJ-12 documents. Bill Moore would not appear on camera for this film. However, I corresponded with him a number of times. He steadfastly maintains that he had no knowledge of or involvement in any Majestic 12 hoax. What is so obvious about it that reveals it to be a hoax? Because Stan has spent an awful lot of years, an awful lot of time, an awful lot of money trying to show that they're not hoaxes, such to the end that if they are, they're mighty subtle, they're mighty intricate, and, and it's a hoax with many moving parts. And Yes, you can carry off a hoax with many moving parts, but there are so many coincidences here, so many things that were unknown seemingly prior to Stan going out and looking into various nooks and crannies of the archives, the, the vast national archive system of the United States that nobody knew before. Uh, things like the date when uh, Walter B. Smith was named to replace uh, James Forrestal, who had died as a member of uh, MJ-12, August 1st, 1950. There's nothing special about that date, except I had the Truman Library people tell me all the times that Truman met with Walter B. Smith. That was the one day in a 10-month period of time. And they met at the uh, west door of the White House, purpose of meeting unstated. Now, I asked the Truman people, the library people, have you provided this information to anybody else? No. How could somebody get that date right? Stanton Friedman has, has doggedly researched this issue, in my opinion, and has done an outstanding job in showing that the arguments of, the, of those debunkers of these documents are really not all that good, and they don't, they don't hold up um, when you analyze them carefully. Okay, here's the top of page two. Briefing officer, Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencoder, MJ-1. Now. Okay, we've just killed it according to another objection. It says Admiral. He wasn't an Admiral, he was a Rear Admiral. Military officer, very conscious of rank. Why did he use a generic title? A lot of people don't understand that you use the term General in common usage in the military to mean a Brigadier General, Major General, Lieutenant General, Four Star General. You use the word Admiral to be Vice, Rear, and Full Admiral colonel to be colonel and lieutenant colonel. Now, they don't sign anything that way, but they're addressed that way. They can answer the phone saying Colonel Jones even if they're only a lieutenant colonel. 
there, there's a casual use of rank for various officers that are listed in there. They talk to refer to a general instead of as a lieutenant general. They refer to an admiral instead of a rear, calling him a rear admiral, which he was at the time, and so on. And the, the group of 12 was a mix of military and civilian personnel. Okay. They're all put in a single list. There's no particular protocol listing, and, uh, you know, where they were with the highest ranking people first and then going down the line. And to me, that's suspicious. A bigger problem, to my mind, is, is that the civilians and the military are all listed together in a single list. In documents like this that I have worked with, that I have created myself, and in fact in which I have been listed, you list the civilians in one column and the, mi the military people in the other column, and you rank them in protocol order with the highest ranking people first. So you separate them out into two separate groups. And uh, these kind of protocol questions are not trivial to people in government or particularly in the military. His point here is totally wrong. The coup de grace came when I visited the Eisenhower Library recently and managed to get a number of memos written by Brigadier General Andrew J. Goodpaster, Ike's staff secretary. These are memos about conferences held with Ike and other people, the head of the CIA, the Secretary of State, mixed bag, mixed civilian and military. At the top he lists all the attendees, the civilians, and they're not, they're mixed in together, they're not all civilian and then all military. It's just some kind of random order, if you will, including General Goodpaster for himself. And General this, who was only a two-star general and three-star general. When I was at the Eisenhower Library, I was able to find out the ranks of all these guys. They've got some really good information there. He signs it Brigadier General Goodpaster. He calls himself a general, not Brigadier General, in the listing. So the fact that Admiral Hillencoder, who was Director of Central Intelligence when all this stuff went down in 47, called himself Admiral, both as the briefing officer and as a member of the group, does not invalidate it at all. And I asked two different Eisenhower Library archivists, what about this generic, that's the way they did things, he said. There's nothing strange about that. That's the way it was. Circumstantial evidence is important in determining the authenticity of the MJ-12 documents. That's not enough for the skeptics, however, who won't believe in flying saucers until one actually lands on the White House lawn. What they want are actual documents from actual archives that reference Majestic 12. And even if you find those documents, that might not be enough. There is one document, however, which we were able to get our hot little hands on, uh, an original, essentially original carbon copy of the uh, cut, so-called Cutler Twining document. Uh, it does mention MJ-12 slash SSP, which we assume stands for a special study group. And that's a document that we can hold on to that says MJ-12. Okay, the Cutler Twining memo is of the of the original uh, MJ-12 documents is the only really original document. Uh, this one uh, was found uh, by, oddly enough, Bill Moore and Jamie Chandray at the U.S. National Archives when they were there going through a set of recently declassified Air Force documents. The reason they went to Washington is that I had been in touch when I made a visit to attend a technical seminar on food irradiation gave a paper in Washington in like March and I checked in with the National Archives which I always do and Ed Reese told me the archivist that we'd been dealing with for years uh, that they were working on classification review of an Air Force headquarters file entry 267 headquarters intelligence stuff Wow Several times in the next few months, we got, Bill and Jamie got strange postcards that seemed to point toward going to Washington, D.C. The return address was Post Office Box 189, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and it was mailed from New Zealand, none of which made any sense. <laughs> so Bill and Jamie went off to Washington, they found another document, a memo from Bobby Cutler, Robert Cutler, to uh, General Nathan Twining, one of the members of MJ-12. Only after they found the Cutler Twining memo and asked Ed Reese to copy it, make a Xerox copy of it, that they realized it was Box 189. 
which had been mentioned on these postcards, that's the box it was in. It was like somebody was trying to give them a clue. And I should point out that that box was first handled two weeks after the death of the last member of MJ-12. Hardly a coincidence. He'd been the last surviving member for two years, Dr. Hunsaker. His obituary was in the New York Times on September the 12th, died on September 10th, 1984. The box was first handled two weeks later. And sounds like the motion was in progress, in other words. I couldn't get the archives. They said they couldn't tell me. I asked the names of the people who handled that box. They gave me an accounting. It was first handled on this date, then handled again before it was served to the public. And Bill and Jamie were the public the following July. They would never tell me the names of the people I asked specifically, and they said they couldn't do that. Without in, you know, putting myself in the position of being indicted uh, by a federal prosecutor, I can tell you that I know that it's possible to take things in that you're not supposed to take in and take them back out again uh, without anyone ever being aware of it. Um, it may be different today in the current atmosphere, but back when, I actually conducted an experiment. I took something in with me, and it was never picked up on. There's false logic here. That it could have been done means it was done? They spent an awful lot of time. Why would they have to go to Washington to come up with the document, get it in the mail just as the roll of film came in the mail? If they faked it, why would they use a strange security marking, top secret restricted? You go with the normal, which would have been just plain top secret. They could have rubber stamped it top and bottom, make it look official. So they've got somebody who's very bright and very stupid. Which is it? For that to happen, you know, with the, with the MJ-12, the Eisenhower briefing document coming out in 1984, and people saying, oh, it probably had been faked within a year or so of when it was made public, and presumably this uh, Cutler Twining document would have also been say, faked within a year or two of its, of its discovery, uh, I would say no. I would say that uh, this had to be an old document, 30, 40, maybe 50 years old. Um, well, not in 1980. 30 years old, probably in 1980 four or five or whatever. It would take that long for this outer edge to get yellowed. Um, it, the creases that had been made in this were perfectly flat, again indicating there was a lot of pressure on it for a long time. Um, and as others have pointed out, it was a onion skin paper with a watermark that was made at the, that was being used by the uh, government at the time that this document would have been made. So I think that provides uh, rather credible evidence that um, the MJ-12 thing, group, whatever, is real. You could say they faked it all. That's easy to say. Well, it's all a fraud. That avoids having to do the work to establish it and avoids dealing with the critiques of the critiques. Oh, it's obviously a fraud. Why is it a fraud? Well, nobody used that top secret restricted. That's crazy. Restricted is the lowest rating. Top secret is the highest. Who would combine those two? That's ridiculous. It turns out the easy way out is that the General Accounting Office, when they were doing their study for Representative Schiff from New Mexico here, they were looking all over the country at all kinds of document archives for documents about Roswell. And one of their entries in a 400-page book about all the things they did was that we were looking through these files up through top secret on December 7th, 1994, and we didn't find anything about Roswell. However, we did notice several instances of the use of top secret restricted, even though we had been told, Majestic 12 in parentheses, that it was not in use at the time. If the GAO says so, it's good enough for me. The problem with investigating the UFO phenomenon is that just when you think you've made it to the top of the proverbial hill, and you can see your destination. You have to turn off the road you were on and head in a new direction to a place you never would have expected. In the case of Majestic 12, that place was the strange and secret world of Dr. Donald Howard Menzel. One of the reasons they held off in announcing the fact that they had these documents was uh, they were trying to track down 
every, peer, every person who was listed in that list, and tracking down and justifying the presence of Menzel on there was difficult, at, le at, the, at the least. Now, Menzel uh, was a, you know, the leading skeptic uh, of flying saucers back in the 50s and 60s. And, I mean, and vehemently skeptical in a way that I've never been able to understand. I mean, absolutely irrationally skeptical. That gave us pause. How could Menzel be a part of this group? Obviously, this is a joke. Some wise guy put this thing together and is waiting for us to say, hey, look at what we got, and then say, gotcha, I did it. So we were very cautious. And so I checked around and found that uh, there were a lot of Menzel papers, but certainly nothing indicating he was on the government side of the fence on, on flying saucers. Then I inquired at Harvard, and Harvard archives had a whole bunch of Menzel papers. Well, I'd like to come see them. Well, you'll need permission, written permission, from three different people to see the papers. Turns out Donald H. Menzel, UFO skeptic, had the longest continuous association with the National Security Agency and its Navy predecessor of anybody in the country. He said to Jack Kennedy, president, before he was president actually, when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more, he said. He had a top secret ultra clearance with the CIA. He was a cryptographer, taught cryptography, code breaking and making before the war. Uh, that he had continued after the war as head of the Naval Reserve Unit, Communications Unit Number 1 in Cambridge, which is where Harvard is. And he did classified work for about 30 different companies. I went away from there convinced that, hey, maybe this document might be true because Menzel passed muster, much to my total surprise. I think the, the Donald Menzel aspect of the whole Majestic 12 controversy is probably one of the most eye-opening that you had this guy who was the arch debunker of his time writing anti-UFO books with down-to-earth explanations and then you find that he, he led this double life where he had high-level links with the intelligence community and did consulting and contract work for them and, and had done so for decades and regardless of whether or not he really was connected to some sort of Majestic 12 group he was very well able to to hide this double life that he had I discovered that Dr. Menzel had a close connection with Vannevar Bush dating back to 1934. Now, Bush had been at MIT. During World War II, he was sort of the science czar. And I had discovered in Bush's papers at the Library of Congress Manuscript Division a letter, a mysterious letter to me. It was from a law firm to Dr. Bush thanking him for all his efforts with regard to the loyalty trial of Donald Menzel and that fortunately uh, Menzel had been totally cleared. We really appreciate all the efforts you made. It was 1950. And it turned out Bush, who didn't have to testify in favor of anybody, uh, he spoke extremely well of Menzel's efforts during the war. And it was clear he knew what they were. It was all together kind of a big thing to see Menzel connected with Bush, who had clearances for everything and, you know, was right top dog in all the classified projects. If it was shown upon Stan's investigations that Menzel was simply that a debunker, then that would have actually have suggested that his involvement in Majestic 12 was bogus and by implication the documents were bogus. But because of the fact that Stan was able to show that Menzel did lead this double life and was heavily connected with US intelligence, that to me is a pointer that whoever put the Majestic 12 documents together was aware of the fact that Menzel would pass muster upon investigation. Stan Friedman spent a lot of time uh, looking into Menzel's career and he discovered that Menzel had a, uh, uh, you know, he actually had a quote secret life. He was, you know, he was a, a naval reserve officer, he, did, he, was, a, he was a cryptographer, a crypt, crypt analyst and so forth for the National Security Agency and a variety of other things. This was not such a big secret as, as, as uh, I think Stan seemed to think it was. I mean, if you knew anything about Menzel, you, could, you would have some general inkling that he was doing these kinds of things. He was involved in them, but even before MJ-12. The question of whether anybody knew about Donald Menzel's uh, high security background is an interesting one. You won't find it anywhere. There, there were people writing about Menzel and his lousy explanations for UFO sightings. But nobody pointing out his very tight connection with the intelligence community. Now, Carl, because he was a member of the intelligence community and happened to be at the right place at the right time, was aware that Menzel was doing stuff for them. 
Nobody else knew that. Now, if somebody wants to suggest Carl prepared the documents, forged them, I'd say he couldn't have because there were other things that he didn't know that had to be known to get the documents right. But nobody else, any of the, uh, the favorite choices, Bill Moore or whatever, knew this stuff about Menzel. Remember, you couldn't walk in off the street and get this. You had to get written permission from people to see those papers. It's, it's easy to dismiss and broad brush these documents and say, oh, oh, obvious hoax, who would ever put Menzel on? Well, it turns out that Menzel's presence there on that list maybe did really serve a purpose. And Stan has gone to great lengths to say why that is the case and has shown why it is the case. It wasn't until Stan had done this investigation of Menzel himself and found out that Menzel was living sort of like a double life uh, that it was possible to justify the idea that, well, yeah, Menzel might be on the list after all if he's uh, trying to do cryptanalysis of the writings and uh, uh, being a um, um, sort of a, almost like a public figure out of all those people. A public figure is associated with a major university and his word would carry some authority in it. So if he says it's all bunk, then uh, <laughs> uh, the general public would tend to believe it. Personally, I think it was a very clever both red herring and a joke. Because in the document, it specifically says, you know, they talk about the origins. They say, well, we've considered the origins of the saucers. Where do they come from? And one of the membership of the MJ-12, Dr. Menzel, notably Dr. Menzel, says that he thinks they came from Mars. Well, Menzel was notorious for his obsession with mythical Martians. Um, he sketched them all the time. He doodled them all the time. He did paintings of them. But having Menzel say, I think they came from Mars, is this clever little hello. Uh, uh, you know, they were, this is really not real. It would appear th that Carl Flock hasn't read the MJ-12 document. It is very clear in there that it is said that while others thought they might be from Mars, some of the scientists, most notably Dr. Menzel, said it was from outside our solar system, the source. He didn't say they were from Mars, he said they weren't from Mars. It's one of those arguments that sounds great until you realize it, it's, it's exactly the opposite of what is said. I can imagine the military people saying, well, where could they be from if they're not from here? And somebody's first thought, you know, War of the Worlds and all the science fiction about Mars uh, would be Mars. On July 29th, 1952, uh, General John A. Sanford, who was the director of uh, Air Force Intelligence, uh, held a press conference. He had been directed to hold a press conference and talk about what was going on. And on that, in that press conference that started about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on that day, he said that uh, we have investigated between 1,000 and 2,000 sightings and have explained the bulk of them to our satisfaction. The FBI sent their liaison person to the Air Force to find out what was going on with all these sightings. Uh, the FBI man uh, was told something rather different from what the general public was told. First of all, the FBI man was told that uh, there are some percentage of sightings that could not be explained. Furthermore, according to this FBI document, some of the military officials were seriously considering the possibility of interplanetary ships, such as ships from Mars. And I can see the scientist, especially Menzel, he was the only astronomer in the group, saying, no, not from Mars. Mars isn't a place where you're going to find any intelligent life. Remember, there has to be somebody who's living there now. It, not a million years ago, which is a wholly other matter. And I can see Menzel saying, no, not from Mars, from other solar systems. So what Carl claims is an argument against it as an inside joke is nonsense. It isn't that at all. It makes perfectly good sense. It would be if it were the other way around. But it isn't. Here's a few other interesting facts about the secret life of Dr. Menzel. He knew and corresponded with Admiral Roscoe Hillencoder. In 1963, Menzel sent him a copy of his anti-UFO book and asked Hillencoder what he thought of it. In a letter where there is just as much between the lines as there is in them, Hillencoder replied that the book was very well done and that Menzel had effectively put to rest all surmises about flying saucers being from outer space. You have done a thorough and praiseworthy job, Hillencoder said to Menzel. This was followed by a letter from Hillencoder to his old chum, Major Donald Kehoe, a leading proponent of flying saucers, in which Hillencoder stated he had never carried on any conversation with Menzel about UFOs and that he took no position on statements regarding UFOs made by Menzel. 
1958, the CIA received a request for the declassification of the entire Robertson panel report from UFO investigator Leon Davidson. Who did the CIA and the members of the Robertson panel turn to for advice? That's right, Dr. Donald Menzel, who suggested rewording the report to cover things up even more. That Menzel was involved with the panel shouldn't come as a surprise, considering that they had listed amateur astronomers as one of the best tools for spreading the government's UFO gospel to the public. Menzel, as one of the nation's leading astronomers, would have been a natural choice to head this effort. Finally, there's the whole Martian thing. Here is a letter to then-Senator John Kennedy, in which Menzel talks about working on the Mars probe and urges Kennedy to support the project. It seems Mars meant more to him than just little doodles in a notebook. The path to enlightenment in the world of UFOs can take you to some pretty strange places. So it was that I ended up one day at an abandoned radar base in El Vado, northern New Mexico, with UFO researcher Scott Ramsey, where I would discover the relationship between truth and fiction and the UFO phenomenon for myself. It's a proven fact, a verifiable fact from the documents that have been declassified, that the FBI and the Air Force had a meeting in October 1988 to discuss the documents. The Air Force assured the FBI that the documents were completely bogus, and this was in a meeting that no notes were taken uh, in the meeting between the Air Force and the FBI. It was just a, a verbal uh, arrangement. Nick Redford sent me a copy of a letter he got from Air Force Colonel Weaver. He's the man who wrote the Air Force's Roswell Report, the big fat Roswell Report, fact versus fiction in the New Mexico desert. The Air Force supplied the fiction, unfortunately. Monster. Okay, he sent me a copy of that letter in which Colonel Weaver goes on and on about everybody knows these documents are bogus. And he sent him along a copy with the word handwritten bogus in big letters on each page. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with that office saying I'd like copies of all memos, letters, all this sort of thing. There's a whole list of things you have to say if you want to cover everything. Uh, that led to that conclusion. Response to my request was, we have nothing in response to your request. So I was not too surprised when later on I was told the FBI has the MJ-12 documents on their website. Wow, I went and looked. And you can tell that they're exactly the same document that was sent to Nick Redford. The bogus is identical. You could put the two pages, and they're handwritten now, not a rubber stamp. So what is the basis for the FBI saying they're bogus? It's Colonel Weaver saying they're bogus. What's the basis for Colonel Weaver saying they're bogus? Nothing. He didn't say that's classified, which is what I expected, an evaluation. He said, we have nothing. If you're trying to manage this problem, and you're trying to control the UFO problem, uh, the, the real problem becomes not to slam that lid down 100% because that's, that is impossible. The real issue, it seems to me, is to neutralize or make useless information that does come out. Colonel Weaver seemed to have no qualms about lying in his Air Force Roswell report. He deliberately left out a qualifying clause in an FBI memo, which subsequent communication had not borne out the belief, uh, this is basically it, that this was a balloon that was found. He left that part out to turn the meeting around 180, leaving, the FBI says it was a balloon. Well, if you read the memo, which he doesn't provide, it doesn't say it was a balloon, it says just the opposite. They found out it wasn't a balloon. This is disinformation. There's the pro side, and then you offer the con, and you sow the seed of doubt in the public mind, so that you realize you're not going to convince everyone, but you'll convince enough people so that people doubt, well, was Roswell this or was it that, or uh, was this object a real flying saucer or maybe a weather balloon? Um, if you sow the seed of doubt, action will usually not follow the knowledge, and that's really the only thing that they care about. I think when people talk about the government knowing things or the intelligence community, there's this image is formed in people's minds that the minute you walk into the US Air Force or the NSA or the CIA that you're simply told this dark and deep secret about crashed UFOs, which I certainly don't think is the case. I think for the most part, employees of the CIA, the NSA, the Air Force, the British government are no more in the know about this subject than anybody on the outside. 
and I think the whole way that secrecy is kept is by hiding information and by ensuring that certain people only know certain aspects of the story or enough to do their own job. And I think that is why the secrecy has been maintained. The Air Force, uh, from 1947 onwards, uh at first, believed that, at first took the attitude that everything that, were, that we were rep people were reporting was probably real. Turns up in the uh, Twining, uh, uh, General Twining's letter in September of 1947 saying that the things that are being seen are real and not visionary or fictitious. And yet, by 1949, 1950, uh, the Project Grudge and Project Blue Book people um, we're trying to sweep everything under the rug, saying it was all misidentifications, hoaxes, or delusions. Uh, I believe that was a result of um, uh, General, when General Vandenberg rejected the so-called estimate of the situation. Uh, in the estimate of the situation written in the summer of 1948, um, Air Force Intelligence at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base had concluded that these flying saucers were real interplanetary, and we've been told and the only reference that we have on this, Captain Ed Ruppelt's book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, he says that uh, Vandenberg rejected the um, estimate of the situation, thereby setting a policy that ET was not acceptable, exp acceptable explanation for UFO sightings. Everybody has to look at why they're doing this. You know, not necessarily the evidence, not necessarily the stories, but why are they doing this? You know, you've got 50 years of blacked out documents of stories being changed, like the Roswell incident four times. And you've got manuals that, that come out that are reporting these things. And they're just trying to lie to you and say since, you know, the late 60s they haven't reported these UFOs, yet both military and commercial pilots are reporting these things. What are you left with to decide, you know, what this phenomenon is? Is it an unidentified space object, like a comet or a meteorite or something, or a planet, you know, like they tried to explain some of the Blue Book files way? It doesn't seem plausible. The only thing that seems really plausible is this conspiracy is massive. You know, that the government is hiding this stuff for so long, and they're trying so hard to keep it from us. Um, I think the last question would be why. And that's what we all have to kind of answer for ourselves. This was it down here. It's 1947, 1948, and you happen to be the President of the United States. Let's say that you learned something important about the UFO problem. Let's say, let's even go a step further and say, like some people claim, that you got access to some sort of hardware that didn't belong to you. If you're not going to share atomic technology with the world, what on earth would you do with something as exotic as alien hardware? Good Lord. You're going to keep it so hidden, you'll have to hide it from yourself. You'd have to restrict access to the most absolutely, utterly, crucially reliable people that you know about, and that's it, and have them figure out what the heck this stuff is, what it can do. And uh, they would be sort of like the, uh, uh, the troll under the bridge that uh, says you, anybody has to have a high security clearance. They make them pay for getting in to see <laughs> whatever this hard evidence is. Uh, they're controlling the doorway to the evidence. Uh, and information might flow into that doorway, but it isn't likely to flow out. I am convinced that something very, very strange happened at Roswell. And personally, I, I do think there's a lot of credible testimony that suggests it was a crashed UFO and that alien bodies very, very possibly were recovered. I think what probably happened in the wake of that, though, was that when the story began to leak out, various deception programs and operations were put into place and anyone who dared to become involved in investigating these things who was outside of the loop would simply find themselves in this mass of confusion a kind of a hall of mirrors where it was kind of difficult to know where the truth began and the rumors and the fake stories ended majestic 12 it all comes down to the roswell incident fact or fiction in the new mexico desert but who's fact and who's fiction?
when the Air Force took it over, it became the Tia Amaria. And then later on in life, El Vado. You dare to go in? Sure, let's uh, let's take a look. You know, you're not afraid of bats, are you? Well, I don't want to get bitten by one. This is it right here. Probably won't want to go back in there. Probably not. <laughs> I guarantee you. And so people speculate that the uh, the radar here was powerful enough to uh, interfere somehow with uh, an alien spacecraft. That's that's a theory. It might have brought it down. Mm -hmm. And they would have had similar radar stations, I assume, down by Roswell. They had one in uh, Corona. And uh, if you read the historical reports we were going through last night, they also had one down at Walker, which was Roswell. Right, right. Coincidence? Yeah, maybe. Uh -huh. Where to next? Well, let's go up and take a look at where the radar was actually put in place. Oh, okay. There's a couple of different sites up there. Okay. Then we'll head to the officer's club. There you go. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'll buy you a drink. None of this proves Roswell happened, of course, or that the Majestic 12 documents are genuine. What it does show, however, is that you shouldn't always believe the skeptics, who for years, until Scott proved them wrong, maintained that the El Vado base did not exist at the time of the Roswell incident. A hall of mirrors, indeed. I think this is the real project. The manpower makes sense. The documents seem to stand up to very strong scrutiny when you start digging into what's at the archives and looking at other documents and looking at the people and all the rest of that. And so I consider these the most important documents, classified government documents, ever leaked to the public. They say that we're not alone in the universe. They say we're not the big shots in the universe. They said the government has known this since 1947, has had an operating group looking after things since that time. Still not convinced that, in the words of Buffalo Springfield, there's something happening here? Well, consider a memo written by this man, Canadian government engineer Wilbert Smith, who in 1950 met with Dr. Robert Sarbacher, a distinguished American scientist working with the U.S. Department of Defense Research and Development Board. The subject of their conversation? Flying saucers. The memo, the substance of which was confirmed decades later by Sarbacher, stated that flying saucers exist, that they are classified higher than the H-bomb, and that a concentrated effort was being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush to determine their modus operandi. Was that group Majestic 12? In my opinion, on the balance of probabilities, if not quite beyond a reasonable doubt, the answer is yes. Now, I don't expect you to take my word for it. Do your own research and ask yourself the question, do you believe in magic? <laughs>